everything that makes you anxious or everything that makes you upset is the same as every other thing that's ever made you upset. All those things that have made you upset that you've never dealt with. They're all laying down there at the bottom of your nasty little soul waiting to pop themselves up in some, in some random utterance, right? And so then you go in there at your peril because if you're the person who pokes around in that, then you're going to get blasted with all of that stuff. It's going to come out like almost uncontrollably. And then, then you can sort it out. What's behind the game you're playing? And the answer to that is all the world that you're ignoring. Always. You're trying to do well in a class and you get a bad grade. Why did I get this C minus? What is it? The answer is you don't know. Do you not know what you thought you knew? Are you not who you think you are? Do you not work hard enough? Are your values not organized properly? Do you misuse your time? Are you in the wrong field? Have, have, is the way you're construing your life completely inappropriate? Are you acting out what your parents wanted you to do and you're pissed off about it so you're only running at 40% to spite them, despite the fact that they're paying $25,000 a year for your education? When, you, when you're in the world and something objects to you, something that matters objects to you, then the, in the entire unrealized world is in that thing that objects. It's all tangled up inside it. That's why it's the great dragon of chaos. It's everything that's outside of your conceptual structure. And what is that? It's everything that lurks outside of your, of your walled city. Well, you get your C minus and you don't do anything about it. Maybe you're a little bitter and more resentful and your study habits get a little worse. So the next time you get like a D plus and then you collect a bunch of Fs and then you stop going to school and then you stop showering right? Then you end up jumping off the bridge. And so that's, a, that's, that's how the dragon eats you when you don't pay attention to it. And so it's no bloody wonder that people avoid, you know, it's really no wonder that they avoid because error messages contain within them the implicit world. Now, the upside of that is, well, they contain within them the implicit world and the world isn't all negative. The C minus can be the best gift you ever had. And that's the gold that the dragon hoards. Right? That's exactly what that means. Every time you try to learn something, you're going to make a mistake, because what do you know? So you're going to make mistakes. And if the rule is every time you make a mistake, you're going to go jump off the bridge, then that's not a useful problem-solving strategy. And so when you make a mistake, you don't get to beat yourself to death with a club. You've got a problem. Something has objected to you. Then the question is, well, what does that mean? Well, maybe you're not looking at the world right. Maybe your goals are wrong. Maybe you're not acting properly. It's okay. So. The question that arises when an obstacle emerges is which part of this structure needs attention? And the first answer can't be all of it, right? Because there's a piece that's broken somewhere. And then you might think, well, let's, let's assume it's a little piece to begin with. That's the right mechanism. Watch the people around you like a hawk. Whenever they do something that you think is good, you tell them, try to do something good and creep right back into their persona. And they'll look around, see if anyone noticed. And sometimes they'll get punished for it. And then, well, then they won't do it again. So don't do that. But then now and then you think, hey, I saw you do this. It was actually, that was actually pretty good. And I know you don't want to because you really want to dominate them. And you don't, you don't want them thriving because then they'd be, a, they'd be competition to you and you wouldn't be able to go complain to your mother about what a miserable partner you have. And you know how delightful that is. So you have to forego all that pleasure if you actually help your person develop. So you got to get over all that. It's really annoying. Now, it's dangerous because they might outshine you. Well, good. Then you have someone to compare yourself to. That'd be a good deal. It's really rough with kids, you know, because parents will stop their children from succeeding beyond them. They get jealous and then they'll put them down and then they have kids that do not like them and they'll pay for it. If, if you aren't suffering from self-imposed misery and you're only suffering from inescapable misery, maybe you could handle that and you know, you could, you could survive, you could bear it and, and even maybe without becoming irredeemably corrupt. So the goal would be, well, yeah, life is a rat's nest of miseries and maybe it has no ultimate meaning. We could say that if we're feeling particularly pessimistic, but it still leaves one question open, which is if you didn't do everything you could to make it worse, how good could you make it be? And the, the least answer is, well, it, it could be tragedy, but maybe not hell. That's the most pessimistic proper statement. The worst case outcome 
in the worst of all possible worlds is that your life could be tragic, but not hell. You're at your mother's deathbed and all you, you and all your idiot siblings are arguing. Well, that's the difference between tragedy and hell. You walk away from a situation like that, sick of yourself and sick of everything else too. And you know, it's often the case that tragic circumstances bring out the dragons because the stress is high and all those things that people haven't dealt with, they don't have the energy to repress. And, and all the bitterness comes pouring forward. If you were all gathered around the bed of someone close who was dying, could you manage it? And if the answer is no, it's like, well, put your life together because it's gonna happen. And you should be the person who's there that can do it and do it properly. And then maybe you'd find that it isn't the sort of thing that will undermine your faith in life itself. You don't wanna be the thing that clings so desperately to the raft that you can't let go when someone comes to rescue you, right? You don't want to be that. So then you think, well, exactly what are you? You're not the chaos, you're not the plan. Maybe you're the thing that confronts the obstacle. And then when you know even further that the obstacle is not only an obstacle, but opportunity itself. Are you so sure that this is a problem? Is that the only way that you can look at it? Or is it an opportunity? And maybe you're in the order and maybe you're in the chaos, but those can flip on you. And maybe you shouldn't be in either of those places. Maybe you should be right in the middle. That's when you go down, you see, when you're down in chaos and you don't know what the hell's going on, you have to rediscover the values that orient people, have oriented people forever. That's what you have to discover. So for example, when I'm dealing with people who have post-traumatic stress disorder, and they've usually encountered someone malevolent, they have to relearn the description of good and evil. Because if they don't, they have no framework. They're lost. They think, well, there's malevolence afoot in the world. Because the only thing that a monster won't mess with is another monster. And you might say, well, I don't want to transform myself into a monster. It's like, you don't have a choice. You can either be a pathetic monster, or you can be a monster with some power. Those are your options. There's no non-monster alternative. Weak or strong. And I don't mean strong like dominating tyrant strength. That isn't what I mean at all. I mean strength like functioning at a funeral strength. And that's a kind of monstrosity. And when you're down in chaos, that's what you have to rediscover. You want to be safe? Forget that. That's not in the cards. You're not going to be safe. Well, then you have to be meta safe. And that's way better because then you're not safe, but you know how to cope with danger. Well, fine. <laughs> that solves the problem. And maybe it's even a better solution because if you're safe, then you just have to stay in your burrow. But if you can confront danger, then you can go wherever you want and you can have an adventure. And maybe that's what you need to do is to go out and have an adventure. So you don't even want safety because how exciting is that? Let's say we made you perfectly safe. All that you had to do is eat cakes and worry yourself with the continuation of the species. What would you do? You'd smash it all down as soon as you possibly could, just so you had something interesting and challenging to do. So you don't want safety. You want to be able to cope with danger. That's a whole different thing. You don't get to be safe ever again. Well, so what happens? You get to be stronger. Well, hey, turns out that's a better bargain anyways. I read this, uh, this piece of work by Jung a long while back, and he, it was a meditation on the injunction to treat your neighbor as, as you would like to be treated. And what Jung pointed out, which I really liked, was that that wasn't an injunction to be nice to other people. It was an invitation to reciprocity. It was something like this. It's like, you should figure out how you would like to be treated like you were taking care of yourself. It's like, imagine you had a child that you really cared for. And, and someone said, well, people will treat this child exactly like you want them to, but you have to figure out what that is. How do you want your child to be treated? You don't want everyone just to be nice to him. You know, you want people to challenge him and you want people to discipline him and you want people to tell him when he's wrong. It's like, you don't just want everyone to be nice. That's, that's pathetic. It's pathetic. There's, there's no challenge in that. You want to treat other people like you would like to be treated. Well, then you have to figure out how would you like to be treated? And while you'd like people to fawn all over you and just lay everything at your feet, it's like, no. That's, that's not something you'd wish for, for someone that you were taking care of. Then there's an additional problem, which is, it's often the case that people will treat other people better than they treat themselves. It's a bit of a meditation on why people don't like themselves very much. I think there's two reasons, really, and one is that we're, we're fragile and damageable and imperfect in multiple dimensions all the time. 
And that often just gets worse. It gets lots of things get worse as you get old, for example. So it's not necessarily that easy for a self-conscious being who's extraordinarily aware of his or her own fragility and but not just fragility, uh, foolishness and errors, his, like you know yourself better than anyone else knows you and you might have a certain amount of uh, dislike for someone you know because of something they did but you know everything you did Jesus, that's a drag, man, you know, you have to carry that along behind it's like, really, I did that, you know you're weak and kind of useless and prone to temptation and you know all those things you know, that just shouldn't be that way. And then you're also capable of pretty vicious acts of malevolence. And so you also know that about yourself. And so it's a real existential question for people. It's like, why the hell should you take care of something as sorry and wretched as you are?